Uh, Mr. President, may I uh, – are we in a quorum call we at the are. moment? First, let me ask uh, unanimous consent that the pending quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. And second, unanimous consent to speak uh, for – it's not going to be 20 minutes, but let's say up to 20 minutes as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, this week we consider a measure for permanent funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund and for our national parks. I would support this measure joyously if there were a similar program for America's coasts and bays and oceans. As it is, I support this measure, but with a heavy and frustrated heart as once again the urgent needs of coastal communities go unaddressed. Put bluntly, the Land and Water Conservation Fund massively favors inland and upland states and projects. As indicated by the prevalence of advocates for it here on the floor from landlocked states. It fails to meet the needs of coastal communities. Over the past decade, for every dollar the fund sent to inland states, per capita coastal states just got 40 cents. The imbalance against coasts gets worse if you factor in that there is greater coastal than inland economic activity. And the imbalance against coasts worsens further when you factor in that much of the Land and Water Conservation Fund's spending in coastal states is for upland, inland projects. Coasts and saltwater are not treated fairly. The upland freshwater imbalance is not justified, and we ought to make it right. Look at Rhode Island. People from around the nation and around the globe visit our wonderful beaches and beautiful Narragansett Bay, and they drive a huge amount of our economic activity. In 2018, Rhode Island's Commerce Corporation reckons 25 million people visited our state, supporting $800 million in state and local tax revenue and over 86,000 jobs. In total, travelers to Rhode Island generated six point eight billion dollars in our economy. Our coast attracts that economic activity. It's a big deal for us. And Rhode Island isn't alone. Over half of Americans live in a coastal county. Nearly 60 percent of the nation's gross domestic product derives from coastal counties. According to the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, I'll quote them here, more than twice as many people visit America's coasts as visit state and national parks combined. Consequently, 85 percent of all tourism-related revenue in the U.S. is generated in coastal states, where beaches are the leading attraction. Beach tourism supports 2.5 million jobs, $285 billion dollars in direct revenue and 45 billion dollars in taxes annually. For all that, the Land and Water Conservation Fund gives 40 cents to coastal states for every dollar that it sends to inland states. And that 40 cents is per capita not adjusted for the greater coastal economic activity and the greater coastal tax revenue and it doesn't adjust for upland uses in coastal states. Coasts are overlooked. I wish it were just the Land and Water Conservation Fund, but look at the inland to coastal disparity in the Army Corps Flood and Coastal Storm Damage Reduction Fund. Over the past 10 years, the Corps has spent out of that fund in various years between 19 and 120 times more on inland work than it has spent on coastal work. Let me repeat that, 19 inland dollars to one coastal dollar was our coast's best year. 
120 inland dollars to one coastal dollar was our worst. Coastal communities are exposed to storms, to sea level rise, to shifting fisheries, to all manner of other conservation and infrastructure challenges, but they received across that decade less than three pennies out of each dollar spent from an Army Corps program that has coastal in its name. This persistent and unfair imbalance against coasts ignores the massive and unique risks that coastal communities, coastal features, coastal infrastructure, and coastal economies now face. Look at the dire warnings of coastal property value crash. Freddie Mac, not an environmental group, has estimated that somewhere between $238 and $507 billion worth of coastal real estate will be gone below sea level by 2100. Freddie Mac warns about that. The economic losses and social disruption are likely to be greater in total than those experienced in the housing crisis and Great Recession. Are we listening? Along the East Coast, the First Street Foundation estimates property values already took a $15 billion hit due to sea level rise. The Providence Journal, using First Street and Columbia University data, reported that Rhode Island lost over $44 million in relative coastal property value from 2005 to 2017. First Street data showed that Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island lost a combined $403 million during that stretch. Hundreds of millions of dollars gone already. And the worst is yet to come. Look elsewhere along the coast. Want to know why Senator Cassidy is so motivated? His entire Louisiana coast is in a declared state of emergency. A recent headline from the Times-Picayune, we're screwed. The only question is how quickly Louisiana wetlands will vanish, study says. That is a quote. That Tulane University study says sea level rise will flood 5,800 square miles of Louisiana coastal wetlands. The report concludes this is a major threat, not only to one of the ecologically richest environments of the United States, but also for the 1.2 million inhabitants and associated economic assets that are surrounded by Mississippi Delta marshland." End quote. Obvious, right? But are we listening to Senator Cassidy? In Florida, coastal communities already see flooded streets on sunny days. Researchers project over two and a half feet of sea level rise in the next 40 years, affecting 120,000 Florida coastal properties in or near rising seas. Some studies say Miami Beach's iconic South Beach has two decades left. Communities in southern Florida are considering abandoning public infrastructure to the sea because of the sticker shock of protecting it. Fish, manatees, dolphins, sea turtles, and other sea creatures have washed up dead on Florida beaches due to toxic algae as the oceans there warm. The iconic Everglades are imperiled. Who is listening? In North Carolina, the Outer Banks face erosion and sea level rise such that the National Park Service warns that enormous swaths of the area will be inundated in this century. As the Outer Banks washed into the sea, there go millions of annual visitors, thousands of local jobs, and a local economy worth over $250 million. Over 5,500 homes in coastal Texas are projected to flood in the next decade homes worth $1.2 billion. Coastal South Carolina, just since 2017, has been hit by four 
different billion-dollar hurricanes. The list of what our coasts are facing goes on and on, and the projected losses are enormous. Here's Moody's Investor Services warning for coastal communities that issue bonds. I quote Moody's, the growing effects of climate change, including climbing global temperatures and rising sea levels, are forecast to have an increasing economic impact on U.S. state and local issuers. This will be a growing negative credit factor for issuers without sufficient adaptation and mitigation strategies. I'd like to ask my colleagues, if you are a small community on the coast, where are you going to go to get sufficient adaptation and mitigation strategies for Moody's? Where are we to help those communities? Here is the Union of Concerned Scientists. I quote, by the end of the 21st century, century nearly 2.5 million residential and commercial properties collectively valued today at $1.07 trillion will be at risk of chronic flooding, end quote. Chronic flooding makes those properties uninsurable and unmortgageable, which is one of the reasons for Freddie Mac's warning about a coastal property value crash. But who's listening? Not the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Our coastal public lands and resources, like coastal private property, face enormous peril. And the Land and Water Conservation Fund virtually ignores that peril. So that is why I am offering a common sense bipartisan amendment. Not a spoiler amendment, not a partisan amendment, not a gotcha amendment, not a poison pill a common-sense bipartisan amendment. My amendment takes nothing away from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It leaves the Land and Water Conservation Fund and its upland bias intact. It separately provides revenues, coastal revenues, dedicated from offshore wind and renewable energy development to support coastal states, coastal resiliency, coastal infrastructure, and coastal adaptation. Unless we do this, millions of dollars in offshore wind energy revenues will bypass coasts and go straight to the federal treasury. Unlike, unlike offshore oil and gas energy revenues, which go in significant part both to Gulf Coast states and, ironically, to the predominantly upland and inland projects of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Don't get me wrong. I don't begrudge our landlocked colleagues their funding. But I do begrudge them refusing me the opportunity to add something for coasts. There should be a coastal and saltwater program to balance the upland and freshwater bias of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Our landlocked colleagues are wrong to stop this amendment. It does them no harm. And the situation along our coasts is dangerous and worsening. Let me, let me repeat, the situation along our coasts is dangerous and worsening. So I'm going to vote for this bill, but I will do so, as I said, with a heavy and frustrated heart. And I will continue pushing as hard as I can for the day when we get parity for coastal communities. Because what we are doing here, refusing this amendment, is both short-sighted and unfair. And this is not my first rodeo on this subject. I got to tell you, I am sick to death of people telling me, you're right, we need to do something for coasts. 
And then as soon as the Land and Water Conservation Fund passes, they're gone. Zippo vanished. My environmental friends say, you're right, Sheldon. Just help us on this, and we'll help you with coasts. And then you don't. My colleagues say, you're right, Sheldon. Just help us on this, and we'll help you with coasts. And then you don't. And now, by making the land and water conservation funding permanent, we are permanently baking in its inland and its upland bias. And there is nothing added for coasts. And everyone is saying, yeah, you're right, Sheldon, but just help us on this, and we'll help you with coasts. Well, my friends, bitter experience tells me otherwise. But you will have my vote, and you will have my help to protect your inland and freshwater resources, as we should. And we, from coasts and saltwater states, will again have to await our day. Today is not our day in coastal states. Today is not our day. But maybe one day, and one day soon, I pray, all this talk will finally turn into action for our coasts. A sense of decency and a sense of urgency would both seem to demand that. I yield the floor.